Well, I like the way you asked the second part of the question, because <laughs> you, you start by asking about water and economic development, and most people tend to talk about how many people have access, how many don't have access, and that's it. But there are many other parts of water. You could assume, for example, that technology may be able to bring water to everybody to drink. But you still have the problem that there's going to be floods and the destruction. You still have the, uh, the problem, potentially, of storage. And so all of these issues fit. So, so what's the linkage? The linkage is that until a country or a region is able to deal with its repetitive flooding and droughts, and usually they go together, if you look at the 16 cases that CSIS and others have identified, countries that are the places where there are the most need in water, these are countries that are suffering from both floods and droughts. In fact, the UN statistics routinely show that roughly 90% of all damages suffered from disasters are from water-related disasters. Now, we could add sea level rise to that in the future. And this means that, as the hydrologists say, the peaks in the valleys of the hydrograph, just like a regular sine wave going up and down, those peaks in those valleys need to be flattened out need to have some stable expectation that they're being managed. If a country is unable to manage the peaks of flooding and the lows of drought, it's unlikely to develop. How do we know that? Well, some of the studies now coming from the World Bank show that in poorest parts of Africa, countries that are unable to deal with this variability are showing a rapid up and down of their GDP. In fact, the fluctuations, well, probably 25 to 30 percent of those fluctuations are due most likely to the inability to manage these peaks and valleys. So think about it. Ask yourself, if you're administrative AID or some other uh, aid agency or external donor, why, what, what impact is your money going to have if almost 30 percent of that fluctuation is dealt with by external factors? Not dealing with those peaks and lows condemns people to a low level. So, once dealing with it, money will flow. If money flows, investment will occur. If investment occurs, there's a platform for people to grow. And I haven't even mentioned excess. All I mentioned was the use and management of water in terms of droughts and floods and disasters. One thing that I think uh, our audience and the students should, should think about in their own studies is that we talk about the delivery of the services of water, meaning uh, we turn on a tap or we, unfortunately, some people have to get a, a pan and pick the water up and carry it. Um, but this is the delivery and the services of water. But when you look at a whole river, how do you look at the whole Mississippi or the whole Mekong River or the whole Rhine? And how is it allocated, partly for flood uh, storages, partly for water supply, partly for maybe for navigation? So to manage it, you've got to find mechanisms in the society where the different sectors of society talk to each other about the water. Agriculture will use the water, lots of it, sometimes 70 percent for irrigation. Transport sectors may need it to float barges. Municipalities and others may need it to store for water supply. Other managers may need it to uh, keep from flooding because they are maybe the business development in an area. All of these different sectors have to use water. It's a means. They have to do something with water to achieve their ends. Public health officials, one of the main reasons for reforms in the 19th century of the United States in water, was because of the public health. So the first key is that these sectors need to discuss with each other how they would use the water to achieve their ends. And in doing this, they're going to have to find some mechanism to coordinate and negotiate what happens. And this is uh, a real challenge. It's been a challenge to the United States. It's a challenge to uh, countries everywhere. What tools do they use, which I think may be part of your other question? Part of it's storage, a major part. The more uncertain the variability becomes with climate change, the more we're going to have to discuss storage. Because 80 percent of the people in this planet live in places where the water comes roughly 20 percent of the time. So how do we deal with this? We 
it, the storage could be dams, it could be underground storage, and then once you have the storage, you're going to have to have some prediction of maybe when the water comes, maybe when it doesn't come. You have some method to do that, to have some means to discuss with those groups that are coordinating how they can use the water and not use it. Excellent.